Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. The ability to read and write is a necessity to live and thrive in modern Western society, and reading and studying the Bible has been of great importance to many Christian groups. This hasn't always been the case, and for much of human history, literacy was severely restricted to trained scribes and members of the elite who had enough leisure time to spend learning these skills. So what about the figures we know from the New Testament? Could they read and write? And if they couldn't, then who exactly was responsible for writing the various documentation of these early Christian groups? Before we dive into that, but good morning, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. This is, um, so this is election day. <laughs> not not the election day, which is uh, in 2024, but already uh, everybody I know is on edge <laughs> because uh, both, you know, obviously I'm, we're not taking political stands in this, in this podcast because it's not about that, but um, it's a fraught time for many people people and who are, I think, on all sides concerned about what's going to happen with our country and where it's going. And uh, it's, um, you know, you you would wish that at some point there could be like sensible and charismatic people who weren't on the extremes, <laughs> but they seem to be few and far between. So, uh, yeah, a- apart from nerves, I'm doing fine. How are you doing today? Uh, similarly, um, I am obviously, as an American, non-American citizen, not able to vote in in local and national elections. So I restrict myself to uh, trying not to worry too too much, and then just doing postal votes for the UK when when I am able to. But yes, it's going to be an interesting one, I think. Well, the UK is, you know, also problematic right now. <laughs> As, uh, yes. So my, my wife is a dual citizen, uh, Sarah, and uh, yeah, so we keep track of both. And uh, and uh, yeah, interesting times for us. I'm, I'm hoping it will become less interesting. Please. As time Please goes on. <laughs> had enough interest for, for a little bit, oh, I think. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Well, okay. Yeah, let's pray for boring times ahead. <laughs> <laughs> boring would be nice. Yeah. But what is not boring is ancient literacy. And ah. I actually find literacy really, really interesting and fascinating. And I could talk for a long, long time about literacy in Mesopotamia, but we're not mm. talking about Mesopotamia. We are talking about obviously the the people of the New Testament who were Jewish and Greek. Before we get into that, it's, as I said in the introduction, it's, I think it's a fair assumption in the modern world that many cultures, most children go to school, at least to learn how to read and write. Was this common also in the ancient world or is this uh, restricted to more modern times? You know, I think it's hard for people today to get their minds around it, um, that, that the idea of mass literacy is actually a modern phenomenon. Um, because we're so used to reading books from the ancient world. If we were interested in the ancient world, we read books and we just assume everybody was reading these books and we all read. And, you know, we, of course we have, there are a lot of people who, who don't have, uh, strong literacy skills or literacy skills at all. And so the, a lot of, there are some very, very fine organizations to help with literacy in the modern world. But the reality is that most people can read a newspaper. Most people can. And, and, um, this idea of mass literacy actually is a modern phenomenon. It came in with the industrial revolution. Um, before the industrial revolution, governments had no reason to put out the expenditures that were required to educate a populace how to read. But with the industrial revolution, it became clear that people who could read could be more productive in the kinds of uh, modes of uh, production that were being developed. And so that's why governments started funding massive literacy. And in the ancient world, there was nothing, nothing like it. Um, People were not expected to go to school. The vast majority of people never went to school. Um, schools were tended to be, and tutors tended to be for the wealthy, um, for the well-placed. Um, or, interestingly, uh, another case would be slaves. Sometimes uh, slaves were educated so that they could help the elite <laughs> uh, tra- train their children and such. But so the vast majority of the ancient world couldn't read or write. 
Do we have any, I know it's really hard, but do we have any estimates for maybe the percentage of people who could read and write in the Roman Empire? Yeah, so there have been really interesting studies. Uh, one of the classics is by a, uh, a scholar at Columbia University named William Harris, who wrote a book just called Ancient Literacy. Um, and he um, he tried to come up with a kind of a basic estimate. And it's a it's a real problem because it depends what you mean by literate. Um, does it mean that you can kind of read a few words? Does that count as literacy? If you say somebody is writing literate, that they're able to produce writing, um, in the ancient world, sometimes that meant uh, being able to sign your name, you know, and that was the only thing you could write was your own name. And do you count that as literacy or not? So you have to take into account like what you're even talking about. But he does that and he explains all the difficulties. And he says that at, he argues and he tries to show it that at the best of times uh, in the ancient world, 10 to 15 percent of the population could read um, and read like make out a sentence kind of thing. Um, some people could read extremely well, obviously, but most people couldn't read at all. And far fewer people could write than could read. Um, part of that has to do with the ancient educational systems. Uh, today, you know, when you start out in whatever year you do it now, kindergarten or first grade now, um, you know, you're basically learning to make the letters while you're learning to read the letters. And you, you, you learn to read and write basically at the same time. In the ancient world, it wasn't that way. You, you, you learned how to read. Uh, and then you learned how to, like, you know, compose sentences and things. And so writing is a much higher level of education in the ancient world. So far fewer people could write than could read. Would this have been different for ancient Jewish societies? We've talked about how Judaism was a religion of a book, of the written word. So would that importance have led to a, a greater percentage of, of a literate population? Yeah, you would think so. And most people do think so. I mean, a lot of people learned what I learned when I was younger, which is that uh, Jewish boys all went to synagogue school so that they could uh, learn to read the Torah. And they may not be able to read, you know, uh, the other stuff, but they could other books, but they could at least read the Torah because that was part of being a Jewish boy. And it turns out that's not true. <laughs> they did not have boys did not all go to synagogue schools. Um, there, there have been a lot of uh, interesting studies uh, about literacy, especially in uh, in the land of Israel at the time. Um, there's a book by a woman named Catherine Hetzer, H-E-Z-S-E-R, called uh, Literacy in Roman Palestine. And it's talking about what the literacy rates would have been at the time, uh, you know, around the time of the New Testament and a bit earlier and a bit later. And she comes up with some startling findings based on scholarship done by others as well. And she says that that probably is more like in, in that part of the world, probably more like 3% were literate. And uh, so how and you think, well, how can that be if you're, you know, if you're, especially if you're a Jew with the religion of the book, how can you be a religion of the book if people can't read? And the answer is the way people could read throughout the world at the time. Most people couldn't read, but some could. And those who could read out loud to those who couldn't. And so reading a book usually meant hearing somebody else read it. And so that happened, you know, happened a lot. And it happened a lot in Judaism. So practically speaking, what exposure would ancient Jewish people have had to writing? Um, both in, in their religious lives and in, in secular life? It completed, completely depended on um, where they lived and what their socioeconomic circumstances were. Um, in the Roman Empire, broadly, 80 to 90 percent of the empire was rural, um, living um, often small villages or hamlets or, um, you know, just small, small places or off by, you know, on a farm someplace. And so most, most were not in urban areas, only, you know, 10, maybe 20% of, the, not even 20%, 10 or 15% of the empire was living in cities. Most of the riding, almost all the riding was being done by city folk. Sometimes, you know, you have some rich guy who's got a, you know, a country place that he'd go out to ride in, but I mean, the, the, it was concentrated in the cities. That's where the wealth was concentrated. 
to be able to afford to uh, your child to go to school, you'd have to pay for it. And one of the ways you had to pay for it is by not having your child working on your farm. And so was, most people couldn't do it because to survive, they needed everybody who was available to, to work. Um, but people in urban areas uh, could ride, and Jews lived in urban areas just as everyone else did. And so in the land of Israel, say in the time of Jesus, there were several large cities um, by comparison. Uh, and so uh, there was the Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, up in, up in the Galilee, and Sepphoris up in Galilee, and Jerusalem. Uh, these, were, these were larger places, and people there would tend to be more literate. That's why, by the way, when Jesus is doing his, his ministry, he encounters scribes, especially in Jerusalem, because that scribe is, the word scribe comes from the Latin word scribo, which means to write, and scribes are ones who could write. They're the ones who copied the scriptures. Um, and so the, the, the country folk basically didn't. And so most of the population was, was from the country. And so most of them didn't, didn't learn to read and write and wouldn't be expected to. So if we look at uh, non-Jewish culture for a second, you mentioned and we've spoken about before that, that Judaism is a book of uh, a book of the te book of the religion, a religion of a book. Um, is this significantly different to uh, non-Jewish, non-Christian people at this time in, the, in this area? Uh, yeah. So this is something that most people would have no idea of. Because we we tend to think of religion in our in our context, we tend to think of religion as being centered on scriptures, and so um, uh, Jews have their Torah, you know, their Hebrew Bible. Christians have their New Testament. Um, Muslims have the Quran. Different Christian groups, you know, Mormons would have their scriptures, the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price, etc. And they, and so you think about books, and when you think about religion, you think about scriptures. And in fact, that was a novelty in the ancient world. Uh, non-Jewish religions, before the advent of Christianity, non-Jewish religions, pagan religions, so traditional religions of Greek and Rome, certainly did have books that were connected with religion, but there was nothing like a Bible, a book that was giving instructions from the gods about what to believe and how to behave and explaining the world and you had you had books that were, were philosophers you know we we'll talk about well how you ought to live uh or some people you know would write books about you know about a god or they would tell myths and things but these were not these were not religions that were centered on writing at all writing had play had little role uh in comparison with with judaism where the torah the law of moses was understood as a sacred book given by God. These laws are God given to Moses. We need to follow this this written text. And the the kind of the importance of writing in Judaism increased after the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Um, a lot of Judy a lot of Judaism prior to that, uh, at least in Israel, was focused on the temple cult and the worship there, the sacrifices there. Once that was taken out by the Romans, then Judaism more and more focused on their written texts and became increasingly uh, a religion of the book. Um, and so that made it unusual. There were there really weren't uh, pagan religions like it with a, that were bookish kinds of religions. If we think then about Jesus specifically in early Christianity, is there any evidence that Jesus, who was uh, a peasant from rural Galilee and I would assume was not able to read given what you've just told us. Is there any evidence to the contrary that he was literate? Well, there is there is some evidence and there's evidence that I think most people would accept that he, he could read and I'm kind of on the fence of it. I'm not quite sure if he could read. What most people don't realize is that there's only one passage in the entire New Testament that says that Jesus could read. <laughs> um, in the Gospels, the, there, there's only one passage where Jesus reads. It's Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in a synagogue in Nazareth, and the um, and like he's visiting there, so they give him the privilege, and so they hand him. He he gets the book of Isaiah, and he opens it up, the scroll 
of Isaiah, and he opens, unrolls it, opens it up to the place uh, that he wants to read, and he reads it about, it's a prophecy of, um, he says it's a prophecy for him, <laughs> that that um, that the Spirit of God has come upon him in order to be able to do these great miraculous works to show that the kingdom is near, and he says this, this reading has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, which doesn't go well down down well with the people in the congregation. They get so upset they try and kill him and <laughs> they try and throw him off a cliff. Uh, so, uh, so it wasn't a very successful reading, <laughs> but it was a uh, it was a reading, and it, it's the only place. So, um, so that um, probably is not compelling evidence of Jesus being the historical Jesus being able to read, because you have that same passage in Matthew and Mark. But there's nothing about him reading. And it, there, he's not, the Isaiah scroll is something only in Luke. And so you're talking about a document written 50, 55 years after Jesus' life saying he could read. And so then it goes back to general probabilities. Many people have said, well, if he's a teacher of Scripture, he's got to be able to read the Scripture. Um, and there's some weight to that argument. But, of course, there are plenty of people who um, cannot read, who have Scripture memorized. Uh, and in the uh, in the ancient world as well as in the modern world, there was no rabbinic training uh, at that time. At that period, there were not official positions called rabbis. The word rabbi just means my teacher. And people could be called rabbis if they were just teachers. But you can be a teacher without being literate. And there have been many, many people who were teachers who were, uh, who were not literate from the ancient world. And so uh, if it's true, as I think it's got to be, that he grew up in Nazareth, uh, and if it's true, as it appears to be from archaeology, that Nazareth was a very, very small place with no public buildings of any kind, no schools there, no synagogue building there, um, a hamlet with, I don't know, 100 families or something, or fewer families, 50 families, um, then... Um, it's hard to imagine where he would have been taught to read. But it's not implausible that he, I mean, it's not impossible. If it had a, if it had a population of um, 400 people and 3% could read, you know, there'd be, there'd be a dozen people there who could read. And so there's nothing to think he couldn't have learned how to read, but it's, uh, but he would not have gone to school and, and you know, grown up in school and been, become literate that way by reading. So as as a teacher or a rabbi, as he's often called in various English translations, it wouldn't have been unusual then for him to be illiterate. He could have taught plausibly based on, on memorization. Oh, it's completely plausible. And we don't know how much of the Bible he knew. You know, we, we, we have no way of knowing how much of Scripture he actually could quote or was even familiar with. He, in, this, in the Gospels, um, he's most... Um, he most commonly um, deals with passages from the Torah, the Law of Moses, and from Isaiah, and there in the Psalms, and there. So there are a few passages, but most of the books he doesn't refer to, and it's not always clear whether these references have any kind of historical rooting or not. People, Christians, much later, of course, talked a lot about the Torah and their interpretation of it. And they talked a lot about the book of Isaiah as predicting Jesus and these other books. But are they are they retrojecting that up back onto Jesus? Um, it's I think it's really uh, it's really pretty hard. So if Jesus most likely couldn't read, what about writing? Do we have any idea of whether he'd be able to write? Um, well, if he you know if he couldn't read, then he couldn't write, and so we can say that much. If he could read, does that mean he could write? Um, in the modern world, we'd say yes, because if somebody reads, they know how to write, usually. Um, but in the ancient world, as I was saying earlier, writing came along at a different time in the curriculum from, uh, from reading. And being able to read didn't mean that you could write. Um, we have some very interesting <laughs> evidence that even people who were scribes sometimes could not compose, could not actually come up with something to write themselves. We have some. We have this. <laughs> we have this thing from Egypt. This where a scribe, like a lo the local scribe for the local like city council, is trying to practice signing his name. <laughs> And he signs it on this piece of papyrus. He got signs it time and time again. About halfway through, he misspells it, 
and at his own name. And then after that, he continues to misspell it. So he's basically just looking at the letters he just wrote and copying them. <laughs> see? So he doesn't even know how to sign his own name. And he's the scribe. <laughs> and so there's actually scholarship on illiterate scribes, uh, as it turns out. Um, but someone like Jesus, um, you know, could he have written? Well, there's no, there's no record of Jesus writing in the New Testament, except in the book of Revelation, where he dictates letters to John the seven letters to the seven churches Jesus is said to dictate. But that's not the historical Jesus. That's the resurrected Jesus. The historical Jesus, did he ever write? Well, it depends what source you read. We actually, um, so in the New Testament, there's only one passage where Jesus is said to write, and that's that famous passage of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery, where the woman is dragged before Jesus and the leaders say that she's been caught in the act of adultery. Uh, we're supposed to stone her to death. What do you say? And Jesus responds by going down on the ground and starts writing something. It, it, it's not, it doesn't say that he's doodling or that he's drawing or he's, he's actually, it's the word cartographo for writing. He's writing something. It doesn't say what. And so on a couple occasions in that story, Jesus is writing on the ground. The problem is that story wasn't originally in the Gospel of John. Um, it wasn't originally in the Bible at all. It was added by scribes. And even if it was there, that doesn't, you know, the Gospel of John is written 60 years later. I don't, I mean, John wouldn't have any independent knowledge of what, whether Jesus could write. There is one interesting place, by the way, outside the New Testament where Jesus is said to be able to write. We have a correspondence between uh, a, uh, a king uh, of Edessa up in Syria. who uh, we, we, It's an apocryphal correspondence. This king of Edessa named Abgar uh, is, is very ill. And he's heard that Jesus can heal people. So he writes Jesus and he says, Jesus, I, you know, I, I'm king up here in Edessa and I'm really ill. I hear you can heal. Could you please come up and heal me? And so you have this letter and then Jesus writes a response. And Jesus writes this, this, his letter to Abgar. And the basic response is, you know, I wish I could come help. Sorry, but I've got other things I need to do. <laughs> he needs to go off and get crucified. And so he doesn't have time to go up to Edessa. But he says, I'll send, I'll send one of my followers up afterwards and he'll heal you. <laughs> and then afterwards, uh, Thomas goes up and he heals him. <laughs> and so, so you ha we have this correspondence. You know, it's an apocryphal correspondence. But it's the only place where Jesus, is, we actually have a writing from Jesus' hands. Is it a similar case for the disciples that, statistically speaking, probably would be more likely to be illiterate than otherwise? I think there's an even higher probability that they could not read and write if it's true, as it appears to be that Jesus collected these um, these 12 men from um, people up in Galilee. Um, and if it's true that they were, you know, day laborers, as they're described, um, then they would not have had an education. Um, people have tried to get around that by coming up with arguments that strike me as implausible. People say, well, and, you know, um, like James and John are said to have uh, been fishing with their father, uh, Zebedee, and that they had hired hired men in his boat so that shows it's a business it's a business he's got he's running a business you can't run a business if you're not literate and they, and they go on to kind of argue you know about and they're just making stuff up because i mean it's a uh, having people work with you in the boat just meant they're as dirt poor as you were they're probably worse off than you are it doesn't mean that you you're running a, a corporation here and uh fishermen were not educated as a rule uh, in that part of the world. There's no reason for them to have ever gone to school. They don't need to be educated. And and other people say, well, Matthew, you know, Matthew had to be literate. You know, Matthew was a tax collector. And you got to be, a, if you're a tax collector, you got to be literate, right? Well, no, you got to be able to count money. <laughs> but tax collectors, people have a false understanding of that too. Tax collecting in a province like um, say in, in, in Judea or in that, that whole area throughout Israel. If you're a tax collector, um, there were some people who were high up in those businesses. Those were corporations and people who were high up had to be able to communicate with their superiors back in Rome and probably had to write, but or have a scribe who could write a dictated letter. But um, most tax collectors weren't at the upper levels. Most tax collectors were the guys banging on your door telling you to hand over your money. And you don't have to be literate for that. <laughs> and so, so we don't, when he's called a tax collector, that does not automatically make him literate. 
uh, it's worth pointing out that the two of the leading disciples, Peter and John, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13, are called illiterate. They're agrammatoi. Um, they're not, they're not, they don't know their letters. So we have a lot of people who are most likely illiterate, and there's no stenographer walking around behind Jesus and, and writing the Gospels and recording his words. So what or who is the first literate Christian that we know of? Yeah, well, you know, we don't, we don't, unfortunately, we don't know the names of very many early Christians, the earliest Christians. Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, the earliest Christians are the 11 uh, remaining disciples of Jesus and a handful of women. And um, the women are even less likely to have been given an education than the men, given the, the patriarchal nature of society at the time. Um, and uh, the men, as I just said, probably were not literate. So the first, um, the per I guess, the first person we know who was literate would be Paul. Um, Paul obviously was literate. He wrote letters that we have, and he's highly literate. He is well educated. He's not at the top of the Roman elite when it comes to education. He's nowhere near that. But he's way better educated than you know ninety nine percent of the education of the world probably, or ninety eight percent. And um, so he's literate, and he converts about three years after Jesus. Prior to that, um, I think there you know there were probably some Christians who could read and write, but we don't uh, we don't have any evidence of it. So literacy probably didn't play a key role during Jesus' lifetime, but modern Christianity, I would say, is very much defined by the Bible, which is a collection of written documentation. Um, do we know when Christianity became a book-based religion, or has it just always been that way? Yeah. You know, you can make the argument, and many scholars have, that Christianity was always a book-based religion because the earliest Christians were Jews, and they understood the Torah, especially to be scripture. And they had other books of the Hebrew Bible that they considered uh, God's word. The Hebrew Bible itself was not a, a closed canon at the time. Today, in the English Bibles, you got 39 books. And there were debates about some of the books at the time. But basically, most Jews accepted the Torah and the, and the prophets and, and so forth at the time. And Christians, too. They considered these to be revelatory books from God that, in their case, um, not only told people how to live, but also predicted Jesus. And so the early Christians definitely were related to books, even though most of them couldn't read them. Um, and as time went on, uh, the expected end of the age that Jesus and his followers thought was coming soon didn't come. And uh, Christian writings became important. Because the Hebrew Bible, of course, was essential, but things have changed now when the Son of God has come into the world and died for the sins of, the, of everyone else. And so, so Christian authorities are needed, and in part they're needed in writing because there are so many Christians claiming so many things about what's true about the Christian faith about what you really should believe, who God really is, his relation to the creation, his relation to humans, how salvation works, who Jesus is. These are all debated issues, and you need some authorities. And so people started collecting books that were considered authoritative, including Paul's letters, and then other books start being generated, Gospels of Jesus and other writings allegedly by apostles. And these were taken to be authoritative to help resolve some of the concerns and issues and debates the Christians were having. And that, that's the beginning of the process of how we got a New Testament. Do we know of any early Christian groups that were not somehow reliant on the written word or because of this uh, relationship to Judaism it just all of them have that basis. Um, yeah, I, so the very earliest Christians uh, would have been reliant on the Hebrew Bible. And um, over time, I think just about everybody in the Christian tradition early on had a closer relationship to books as part of their religion than pagans. Um, and that the, the, when the Gentiles converted, um, when, like Paul started converting Gentiles, he appears to have explained to them the importance of the Jewish scriptures, and in order to show in part that Jesus was the fulfillment of these scriptures, and um, had to explain them and explain why, for example, even though God tells you not to eat 
ham, <laughs> you can <laughs> if you're a Gentile. And so, so I think they had to explain these books. And then as time went on, they got increasingly literary because you have all these Christian books that start showing up. And then you have to start deciding which of these books are the ones that are authoritative. So if we're looking at, at authoritative books in the New Testament, Paul's letters are obviously really foundational uh, for that and obviously required both literacy for their creation and dissemination. So would you say that this reliance on literacy is characteristic of the spread of Christianity or is this just an exception that happens to have been preserved? Yeah, you know, the liter literacy played a big role in Christianity, not only because they had sacred books, but also because uh, it becomes this worldwide movement. And it was different from other kinds of religions that could be found throughout the empire. So that, for example, um, the worship of Zeus was found in Greek speaking parts of the empire everywhere. But there was no understanding that, like that it was a worldwide movement. It's like locally you had your worship of Zeus and in some other locality they have their worship of Zeus and they'd have some things in common, but some things different. Zeus is actually given different names in different places. And, and so with Christianity, the idea is there is one church and it's manifest in lots of different places. And so um, this unity is enforced by the literacy. Because uh, when Paul writes a letter, when he writes a letter, he's writing a letter to people who are living in a different place. Um, and he's trying to tell them that his letter is a substitute for his presence. And so the letters are binding communities together. Um, and so it's providing for the unity of the church. And so Christianity becomes unified in part because they're communicating so extensively. And so it isn't that these people getting Paul's letters think that this is a, uh, you know, that this is the word of God. It's just a letter, but it's representing the apostle's voice. And so this is how Christianity becomes a worldwide religion that's understood to be like a church rather than a bunch of different religions. And, you know, you just didn't get that in the Greek and Roman worlds. Last question before we wrap up, were the Gospels meant as missionary literature to teach others and to convert others and, and show the significance of Jesus, or were they intended for internal use, for use among people who were already Christians? You know, I, I've, I've known a lot of people who have imagined that the Gospels are like being handed out like tracts, you know, like, uh, you know, on the street to kind of convince people and that, you know, you write a gospel and then you give it to your next door neighbor so he'll realize, you know, that Jesus is the Messiah. I really don't think it worked that way at all. I don't think anybody who wrote a gospel had any expectation that a non-Christian is going to read this and become convinced. I think one piece of evidence people have used that it might have been occurred that way was because of the Gospel of Luke, which is dedicated to somebody named Most Excellent Theophilus. And since that term Most Excellent in Luke's writings otherwise refers to uh, Roman administrators, they thought, well, this must be given over to a Roman administrator, and so it must be a missionary document. I just don't, I don't think that's right at all. I think that these authors are writing for their communities to explain to them the correct understanding of who Jesus was and what he did and what, and what he said, uh, including Luke, and that, that their inter, their inner literature, in, in, like their, their literature for within the church. They're meant to educate people so that they can go out and talk to other people about Jesus, but they are not, they're not written for the other people. They're written for the people within the church. So I don't, I absolutely don't think they were missionary documents. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're going to end there and take a brief ad break and we'll be back with Bart's weekly update. I'm Bart Ehrman and I'm happy to announce that I'll be doing a new remote course called The Scribal Corruption of Scripture, How the Bible Was Changed and Why Readers May Never Know. The course will be given on November 11th. It will consist of four lectures of 50 to 60 minutes each with a long Q&A to follow. In recent years, non-scholars have come to realize what scholars have long known, that we don't have the originals of any of the books of the New Testament. We only have copies that were made many years later, in most cases, hundreds of years later. The copies that we have are all filled with mistakes. Should this matter to you? Most of the mistakes found in our manuscripts don't matter, but some do, and some matter a lot. You can judge for yourself. 
Does it matter if the Gospel of John doesn't call Jesus merely the Son of God, but describes him as the one and only God himself? Does it matter whether the Gospel of Luke indicates that the death and resurrection of Jesus are not what make a person right with God? Does it matter whether the Trinity is explicitly mentioned in the New Testament? Does it matter whether Jesus actually suffered when he went to his cross? Does it matter whether Jesus actually suffered during his passion? Or that he became the Son of God at his baptism or his resurrection? Does it matter to you that the scholars who claim we could know what the New Testament authors originally wrote can't agree among themselves about the words that these authors produced. These things are very interesting and important to me, and if you find them interesting and important, then I hope you'll take the course. In the course, I'll be dealing with a lot of issues and examples that I've never discussed before. Not only will we be looking at where scribes change the texts, we'll also be seeing how it is manuscript experts decide what the original text was and what got changed and why. In this course, I'll be including some information that many New Testament scholars don't even know, but I'll be doing so in layperson's terms that you can understand. Again, the course is going to be recorded live on November 11th with four lectures, 50 to 60 minutes each, with Q&A to follow. If you're interested, you can register at bartermancom slash scribal changes. That's bartermancom slash scribal changes. The issues I'll be addressing in this course are extremely important to me and have been ever since I've been an adult. I hope you can come and join me. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ermanblog.org happenings and online course launches. Bart, what is happening in your world this week? Well, this week I'm doing this course that we've talked about on here um, that is on uh, the scribal corruption of scripture that deals with how we don't have the original writings of any of the books of the New Testament, but only copies made usually mm -hmm. century, many centuries later, and how that affects things, because these copies have so many differences in them that we have to figure out what the authors originally wrote and figure out why scribes wanted to change what they wrote. Why didn't they just copy it correctly? And um, one of the reasons I'm really interested in this is because this has been a passion of mine from the time I was about 18. Literally, uh, I first started thinking about the problems of the changes that scribes made before I knew Greek, before I knew much of anything. But I knew that there are passages that uh, are reported differently in different manuscripts. At the time, it didn't affect my faith at all. I was a conservative evangelical. But um, I uh, but I realized that if, at the time I thought, you know, if God inspired the words, boy, we need to figure out the words because we're not sure what they are. And so that that eventually did have some some impact on, on the way I believed uh, about the Bible. But uh, it became a passion of mine. And it's I wrote a master's thesis on this topic. I wrote a Ph.D. dissertation on this topic. The first 20 years of my life, I worked on this topic. So this is like thing that I, this is what I you know I was doing. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really excited about this uh, because I'm able to share uh, some of what scholars know to a non-scholarly audience and uh, communicate things that I haven't said before in my books or, or in my other talks. And this is this is a course of four 50 to 60 minute lectures. Uh, the price is $39.95. It launches this week, doesn't it? It launches this week. It's going to be on uh, November 11th is the date that I'll be doing these live. And people buy the course, they can come live. They can buy the course and not come at all and still get the course. <laughs> but if they, they, if they buy it, you know, they, they can come and hear me do it live with a, with a live uh, Q&A. Uh, and so people can ask questions if they come. And if you are interested in that, the uh, link is misquotingjesus.com. So you can go there, find out more and uh, attend if you feel so inclined. And we're going to move on now to our final segment, which today is Outsmart Bart. So we have questions from a listener to try and stump our resident New Testament expert. 
Dr. Ehrman has written six New York Times best-selling books and holds a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. It's not often you'll see him made a fool, but it doesn't hurt to try. It's time for Outsmart Bart. All right, Bart, are you ready? Yes, I'm... As you'll ever be. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Question one. Which middle Platonist philosopher is attributed with this phrase? What is Plato but Moses speaking Attic Greek? You know, I'm tempted to say Philo, but I don't think that's right. Um, huh. I should know this. This is common knowledge. <laughs> Numenius. <laughs> Indeed, I was going to say it's what? common knowledge to everyone but me. You are correct, sir. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I'm better than I thought. Whoa, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, question two. According to the Gospel of Truth, which entity caused Jesus to become powerless and thus crucified? Is it darkness? Error. Error, yeah. Apparently, and I'm going to have to ask, what is the gospel of truth? Because I don't know. It is one. a great, it's a great gospel. I really should, uh, should have it better, better under my, in my head, because it's one of these great Gnostic gospels that is a very powerful description of, of, uh, of Jesus in kind of mythological terms, but it's not like complicated mythology the way you get in a lot of the Gnostic texts, like the Apocalypse of John or these others. It's a very moving and powerful description of of Jesus and the way he was received in this world that rejected the light and the knowledge that he brought. Very moving text. It was one of the texts discovered in the Nag Hammadi Library in uh, 1947. And so if somebody gets a copy of the uh, Nag Hammadi scriptures, say by, uh, written, uh, translated by Marvin Meyer, they can see a, a very good translation of this gospel of truth. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, one final question. In the Ascension of Isaiah, what is used to carry out Isaiah's martyrdom? Oh, well, this is this is uh, this is where people get the idea from that uh, Isaiah was sawn in half. Um, he, it's a saw, <laughs> and so the uh, Ascension of Isaiah is an interesting Christian text um, that some scholars, I think, wrongly have dated very early. Uh, into even into the first century. I think that can't be right. But it's uh, part of it is about is a kind of a narrative of, account of Isaiah being martyred. But the other is a revelatory vision that he has uh, about going back up into heaven. And uh, he needs to have these passwords that he can get through these levels of heaven so that they can go on to the next one. And it's a very mystical, interesting text. Uh, and so um, it's a Christian text, but it's called the Ascension of Isaiah. You've got two out of three correct. Congratulations. Okay. That is two more than I would have got. <laughs> well, Not surprising, well, given you're the expert in the house. Yeah, well, <laughs> not about all these things. <laughs> but they're, they're all great texts. Uh, these are all great texts. So, Excellent. Well, before we finish for the week, would you mind summarizing what we spoke about? And if there's somewhere that people can find out more information. Uh, yeah, so in this... Um, in this talk, we've, we've been um, talking about the literacy of Jesus. And did Jesus, um, did Jesus know how to read and write? And how do, you, how do you understand that in the context of the ancient world? Um, most people could not read and write. In fact, a large percentage of people could not read or write. And was Jesus an exception? What's the evidence one way or the other? And then how literate did Christianity become and how important was literacy to Christianity? How important were books for Christianity? These are essential questions for understanding the development of the Christian religion. And so we've scratched the surface, but we've hit a lot of the really important points about it. Thank you, Bart. Audience, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartoman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? Uh, we're talking about a classic problem within the study of the New Testament that became pronounced as a problem, uh, beginning with the Protestant Reformation, which is, does the book of James 
in the New Testament contradict the teachings of Paul in the New Testament? Is Are James and Paul on the same page, or are they at odds with each other? And uh, we'll, we'll be addressing that one head on. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.